In Mark 1.21, we saw Jesus coming down with his disciples to Capernaum and start teaching on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And this is exactly the moment when things start getting interesting. So this is when Jesus starts preaching in the synagogues. Let's see what happens. Mark 1.22, let's start reading. Kai exeplesento epi te didache autu. En gardidascon autus hos exusian eikon, kai us hos hoi grammateis. Let's start analyzing this general structure of the sentence. So the sentence starts with the kai, as usual, conjunction, and. And then you have your verb. This is the principal verb of the sentence. And then you have this preposition, a p, that is followed by te didache. So a p te didache is a prepositional phrase. And then you have this autu that we saw many times, which is a genitive. All right, of him. And then there's a comma because there's another sentence that starts where N is the verb of the second sentence. Gar, we're going to see just an adverb. It means in fact. And this N is connected with this didaskan, which is a participle. All right, so you have a verb connected with a participle. And then you have autus which is the object of the verb, all right? Um, and then you have this structure, hos exusian eikon kai uk hos hoi grammate. So there's some parallelism here. You see hos, hos. Hos is an uh, adverb that means as, like, okay, as if. All right. So as Aikon, this is another participle. Uh, you see the same ending, the daskon Aikon. Okay. So this participle is the one that is connected with this exousian. So exousian is the object of the verb Aikon. And then there is this parallelism and uk. Uk is not. This is a negative adverb, negative particle, as a conexusias and not as hoi grammates. Hoi grammates is, you see, it's a nominative, it's a plural, so it's a comparison. All right, we're going to see who these hoi grammates are. So now that we know this general structure of the sentence, let's try to go one by one. First, the first sentence, and then the second one, which is more complex, and try to understand the meaning of it. All right, let's start from the verb. Exeplesento. It's pretty complicated. Let's try to break it down. So first of all, you have this X, which, as we've seen many times, is just the ek preposition. That means literally out of. In front of a vowel, the kappa gets softened in a C. So it's not ekeplesento, but exeplesentos, but it's the same preposition. That literally means out of. Then you have this epsilon. This is not part of the verb itself. It's not part of the root of the verb itself. It's just there to tell us the tense of this verb, which is imperfect. So the imperfect tense, as you probably know, we said it many times, it indicates an actions that is continuous in the past. It's something that continuously used to happen, all right? And then you have the root of the verb, which is this plus, and then you have the ending that tells us that this is a third person plural, okay? Third plural, so it's a they, okay? They used to do something. Now, the root you see here is this plus, and the verb is pleso. Now, the verb pleso means literally to strike, okay? To strike, to smite, all right? It's a very strong verb, all right? If you think about an English word, pleasure, that's that instrument that usually uh, doctors use to hit your knee uh, to check your reflexes, right? 
So that's the idea of Plesso. It's like striking, hitting something to flatten it out. So to smite, to strike. So the idea of ek plesso, ek is there to make this verb even stronger. You're, you're hitting something out. You're striking out, all right? And this ending, not only onto, it's not only third plural, it also tells us that it's a passive form. So this they, which is referred to the people that were there in the synagogue, they were hearing what Jesus was preaching. Mark is telling us that they were hit by the way that he was talking they were really amazed they were struck they were astonished that's probably the the the, the better translation they were completely astonished as if they were struck by each word that would come out of the word of jesus and the important part is this imperfect tense this is not something that happened once this is something that would continually happen every time, every Sabbath, that Jesus would go to the synagogue in Capernaum. People were getting struck by the way he thought. So we could translate they were astonished. About what? Well, this prepositional phrase, a P tedidakeo too, tells us exactly what they were astonished about. The preposition a P can mean many things. Usually means on or at. All right. So they were astonished at. And it's generally followed by a dative case. And in fact, that's what you get. You have this eta with iota substring, eta with iota substring, which is a dative feminine singular, right? So they were astonished at we know it's the um, definite article, which means the. And the noun, the term is didake. And didake comes from the verb didasco. We saw this verb already because it's an important verb. It means to teach, okay, to teach. And by the way, we're going to see it here also in the second sentence. So it's a verb that is very important. Jesus was doing this in the synagogue. He was teaching that his what that was his activity. Didache is the noun coming from this verb. So didache is the teaching. Okay, is the teaching. So they were amazed, they were astonished at the teaching out to of him. And as usual, this is the usual Greek construction. And we can translate, and they were astonished at his teaching, all right? This teaching is exactly the activity of a rabbi. We talked about that in the previous video. Jesus is going to the synagogue acting as a Jewish rabbi. That's exactly what Jewish rabbis would do. They would go to the synagogues and they would teach. They would explain scripture. And that's exactly what Jesus does. But there's a big difference between Jesus and every other rabbi. Gar. Gar means in fact, indeed. Here Mark wants to explain us the way and the reason why they were astonished. All right. And he says, in fact, N. N is the verb to be. We've seen it many times already. It's the imperfect tense. So agrees with this idea that this is something that didn't happen just one time. It was happening every time that Jesus went to the synagogue. So it's the imperfect of the verb to be. So it means he was, this is a third person singular. Okay, so and means he was. So the first part of the verse is related to the people in the synagogue that were listening to Jesus. The second part explains why Jesus was so special. In fact, he was didaskon. We saw it, right? So didaskon comes from the verb didasko, which means to teach. This is the present participle, okay? Um, in the nominative case, because the subject here is Jesus, and this on ending is a masculine singular. So in fact, he was teaching, all right? He was teaching who he was teaching, he was teaching them. 
you have it here. Autus is the direct object, uh, personal pronoun, third person, plural, masculine. All right. So, and in fact, he was teaching them, Hos, Hos, we saw it as, as whom? As Aiken. Now, this is another very important verb. So we have the verb to be here, and, and then we have also the verb to have, the two most important verbs in, in possibly any language. So echo, the verb echo means to have. And this ending, aken, which is the same as this ending, didaskan, again, is a present participle nominative, uh, which translated in having. Right. So, in fact, he was teaching them as having, as if he had. All right. As having what? This is the direct object. All right. We see from this ending, alpha nu, which is a feminine singular accusative case, as having what? Exousia. Now, let's spend some time on this. Exousia is a term. Uh, a powerful term because it means authority, it means power, all right? So when somebody has exousia, it means they it has some kind of power over somebody else or some kind of authority that people recognize. So Mark is saying that he was teaching them not just as a normal teacher would do, but as something, as somebody that had authority, that had power. This term exousia is, for example, uh, used every time that Mark needs to say that Jesus had authority or power over demons. When uh, Jesus would drive demons out of people, he had power, authority over them. This exousia is this power. So he was teaching, Mark is saying that he was teaching, Jesus was teaching not just as a normal teacher would do. He was teaching with some kind of authority. That's why they were struck. They were astonished by the way he was speaking. Because he was speaking with that type of certainty, with the type of authority that they have had never experienced in anybody before. He was speaking as if he had the truth. Not just as somebody that was trying to find the truth. That's what Mark is saying. Well, we know that because Jesus is the truth. But they didn't know at that time. So they were astonished by this fact. And here things get very funny. Because Mark could have just stopped here. He could have said they were astonished at his teaching. In fact, he was teaching as having authority. He could have stopped the sentence there. But Mark wants to go farther. He wants to be very explicit in what he's trying to say. He's really rubbing it in. He's saying he was teaching with authority. What does that mean? Well, kai uch hos hoi grammateis. And not as the scribes. So he wants to make it perfectly clear that Jesus is not as the scribes, the scribes, who were the scribes? These hoi grammates, well, you see that root grammar, which in English uh, still lives in words like grammar, right? Um, it's related to the ability of writing, right? So the grammates, they were the scribes. The scribes were the one that knew how to read and write. And they were, at that time, those that... Uh, we are entitled to read the scriptures and understand and interpret scriptures. So they were the ones that thought they had the authority to interpret scripture. They were basically the modern scholars. Grammates were the uh, Jewish scholars of that time that would read scriptures and they would tell people how to interpret scriptures. In the Jewish culture, the scribes were called soferim, okay? Soferim, okay? Those were the scribes, okay? And it comes from the 
um, Hebrew word sefer, which means book or scroll. So the soferim were the ones, that, the guardians of the scrolls of scripture. So they were the one that would copy, right, the scriptures on scrolls. They have all these uh, rules of how to, all these formatting rules on how you would have to copy scripture uh, on these scrolls and so on. So they were the guardians of the law and they were the ones, the only ones entitled to interpret the law, interpret the Torah, interpret scriptures. So being the scholars of that time, they were also usually arguing against each other. If you are familiar with the modern scholars, well, you know what happens, right? You have a, Bible, a verse in the Bible, and then you have a hundred different scholars that have hundreds of different interpretation of the same verse. And they start arguing with each other on the meaning. And they start pulling up other verses from the Bible to defend their position and support their position. And they're throwing verses at each other to show that their position is better than another position and so on. That's exactly what happened at that time. If you go and read about um, how the, the, the Jewish tradition um, was interpreting scripture, and you find that, for example, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, right? You see how uh, the Jewish rabbis were trying to interpret scriptures. And you had more authoritative type of scribes um, that, you know, in the past were considered to be uh, very authoritative. People would um, try to argue based on what other scribes in the past had said. And so people were coming up with different interpretation and they were usually trying to back up their interpretation and say, well, this rabbi at that time said that. And then another scribe would come up and say, well, but this passage seems to contradict that. And so another scribe would come up and say, well, but you have to consider what these other scribes said 100 years ago. And they had all this tradition of, of what said or who said what. And so it's if you read parts of the Talmud or the Mishnah, it's so very confusing because it seems like that all these contradicting views don't ever get anywhere. And that's probably what people were used to at the time. They were going to the synagogues and they were hearing different rabbis teaching and different meanings of different passages in the Bible and sometimes probably even contradicting themselves. All right. And so they were used to rabbis, to scribes. They were trying to back up their argument, going back to the tradition of what other rabbis said in the past, 100 years before, 200 years before, and so on. But here you have another type of rabbi. You have Jesus that is not just quoting other rabbis. He is speaking with authority. He doesn't need to back up what he's saying based on what other rabbi or other interpretation in the past. He is telling what the truth is. He's not comparing arguments. He's not making arguments. He's not trying to propose interpretation. He is saying what it is, what it means. And that is exactly what struck them, what astonished them. They had never seen anybody talking like that. One last thing. This idea of people being astonished at Jesus' teaching appears in another passage of a synoptic gospel, appears exactly in Matthew. But it doesn't appear at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew as it appears at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. It appears in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 is the conclusion of the very long Sermon on the Mount. And here is exactly when Matthew says that when Jesus finished talking, look at here, exeplesento. Hoi okloi epi te didake autu. This is exactly the same expression that Mark uses in Mark 1.22. They were astonished at his teaching. You see, Matthew takes exactly the same expression that Mark uses for Jesus' teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum and uses it to describe the astonishment of the people 
soon after they heard the Sermon on the Mount. This is another hint that Matthew is using Mark as a source. Uh, a lot of people that think that Matthew came first and Mark used Matthew blame actually Mark for having deleted the Sermon on the Mount. And they just say, how could Mark possibly delete the Sermon on the Mount and just leave the, fun, the result of it, the fact that people were astonished at his teaching without ever putting what he's teaching where? Well, this would be problematic, of course, if we think that Mark knew what Matthew wrote and decided to complete, erase, or bypass the Sermon on the Mount and just say generally that we people were astonished at his teaching. But if you go the other way around and you actually think that it's Matthew that used Mark, then everything makes much more sense. There's no need to blame Mark for deleting the Sermon on the Mount. Mark probably never heard the Sermon on the Mount from the mouth of St. Peter. That's probably why he never put in his gospel. Remember, Mark was not a night witness. He was reporting the preaching of St. Peter. So it could be very well be that he never heard um, the Sermon on the Mount from the mouth of St. Peter. That's why he doesn't put it in his gospel. So there's no need to blame Mark for erasing anything. It's just the beauty of the synoptic gospel right here. Matthew probably is, is, is struck by that sentence that Mark uses, and he just reutilized exactly the same expression you see here. Exeplesento epitedidache autu. It's impossible to think that Matthew came up by itself. This is copy and paste from Mark. And he thought that that sentence in Mark uh, was absolutely appropriate to be put at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, because Again, people that heard that speech were absolutely astonished.